get this party started. Hey! Yeah, this is the Excellence Podcast. I'm Miles. I'm doing it live this time. We'll see how this goes. So, uh, what is this? Yeah, I had a conversation uh, last night, I think. Yesterday. about it, it was a conversation about fear and anger. I was reminded, you know, I'm a big Star Wars fan, huge, huge proponent of that. I mean, I I was, what, six when the first movie came out. It's been part of my life the entire time. So, of course, a lot of the, the, the language of, of the Force and, and Star Wars, dark side, light side, all the rest of that, it, it instills and it's part of everything that I do. And that being said, there's that line from Yoda that, that he talks about where, Fear leads to anger, and anger leads to hate, and hate leads to suffering. And that kind of thing, it led me to think about, you know, this is a really, really binary way of looking at these emotions. I, these emotions, I have, a, I have a philosophy to all this, and that is that we as human beings, we have three elements to us that really make us really capable and and really do manifest the the magnificence that is what we are as humans the first one is science or or actually take it a different approach reason the ability to observe to make observations to to come up with new ideas of what those observations mean and to dial those in to, to test these observations and to see if we can can build something else up onto things. And this leads to, I guess, this, this gives us this, this way of looking at things. Can we rationally interpret with logic, reason, and observation and testing? Can we, can we interpret the world that we're in? And it's this amazing capability of our mind to do it. The second one is industry. We're motivated to do things. We're motivated to build. We're motivated to make things to bring more into the world, whether that's a family or whether that's a, a business or whether that's art or some other creation or, in my case, a, a message. There's, a, there's a, an almost a, a compelling aspect of humanity when empowered and when engaged to want to bring that part to the fore to really want to bring that forward and that's this this notion of industry this notion of creativity this notion of of building of of manifesting and that's different than our our reason that's different than our intellectual capabilities of being able to work through them but they work together in a combination that works well and the third one is our passion and that's that residual piece of our primal selves, the emotional makeup of who we are and how we feel, and the 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 various pros and cons, the various ebbs and flows of that emotional existence. It's it's almost as though it is a I, I like to look at it as a sixth sense, not not sixth sense as in you know ESP stuff, no, but a sixth sense in that idea that that we're able to we're, we're, we're able to to perceive things through this other medium there's our eyes that can take in light there's our ears that can interpret sound there's our tongue that can interpret taste and there's touch that we can interpret pressure and temperature there's nose which we can interpret sense and in this one in addition there's this there's this thing that's almost like an extra organ organ it's our intuition it cultivates with time and we develop it over time and it's the emotional impression that the world gives us it's so refined and automatic in our world that we could even we could even make efforts to perceive the world purely in emotional context and we can see how the things interconnect through that and we become very very committed or very invested or very engaged or very affected by these things both through our own personal projection and through the projections of others as they they bring their emotion to us because we as human beings are essentially an emotional being 
all three of these factors and i'll just for person for for caught for for perspective of the conversation i'm going to re restrict it to to passion science and industry any of these three taken to extreme is very destructive it becomes oppressive it becomes overwhelming science without heart uh, you know, science fiction's full of bad guys that do that, 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 that remove the human compassion factor from scientific innovation. Industry without reason and without compassion comes in at, you know, when we see the, the, the Wolf of Wall Street type of thing, when we're talking about the, the, the various, um, you know, very, uh, they're productive folks. They're, they're good things. It's the, it's the, the people that are worried about the risks of the Ayn Rands of the world, Ayn Rand or however you pronounce it. Uh, the, the reality of these things is that any one of them taken in, in to any extreme, it unravels. They each need each other. We apply the 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 wisdom of reason and and that we leverage the the momentum and the strength of our industrial notion that that desire to build something and then we complement it and we bring it life we bring it meaning through our passion or compassion or, or through our emotional being. And it's all three of these being brought together that really elevate us to a level where we can truly bring something remarkable to the world. Now, one of the things that I'm looking at is the conversation that I have with fear and anger. So this old Yoda idea, you know, that, that view of A leads to B, B leads to C, C. That is certainly one manifestation, sure. That could be the way that that comes out. But really, that isn't how that works. Not, not really well. Because it, you know, fear, fear is a very complicated thing. Fear leads us with a, a possibility of, of, being engaged at a level where you know fear serves a very valuable purpose it kept us alive for 40,000 years it's a it's a valuable emotion it tells us that things are not good that there is danger that there are very real risks involved and we need to be able to engage there we need to understand that we need to we need to participate in life in a way to keep ourselves safe and so I, I like looking at fear as it, it's not a problem to feel fear. Being fearful is a thing. It's, it's real. I mean, we, we're, fear, is, fear is fear. It's how we interact with it and what we, what we leverage it with, how we, how we engage it that makes the difference. Uh, for example... I'm a big fan of Maslow. Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If you if you listen to me talk at all, it, it's it's one of my go-tos. The triune brain and Maslow's hierarchy of needs are, are really valuable models for explaining or or evaluating these things. And in Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it's a it's a pyramid shape, and it, and it at at the bottom level, the big base level of the pyramid, it has survival what what do we need to survive you know food shelter water you know, these kinds of things these are these are necessary for survival and while we don't have them we must resolve that problem it's, it's a primal level engagement and so because we are we have the 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 primal aspect of ourselves in most occasions when we don't have the survival level taken care of it dominates all of our thought there was a uh, there was a study I saw once on some people that were going on uh, just these extreme diets to try to get down to a size zero. It was a, a couple of, of reporters were trying to do this, and one of the aftermath moments was when one of the one of the reporters was getting information from her coworkers and saying, 
you know, what was it like? I said, well, all you ever talked about was food. It was the only subject on your mind. It was the only thing that mattered. And everything else was, was revolving around food. And so here's this case of the human brain. We're, we're, we're starving. We don't have the food we need. I mean, she was on some kind of liquid, I think it was a, a liquid fruit diet, something like lemon, lemonade or something. I don't know. Um, and she, and so the human brain took over and said, well, no, no we're going to consider ourselves food. There's stories of people when they're uh, uh, shipwrecked or, or when they're in a, in a lifeboat. Uh, there was a story I heard about people that were on a lifeboat that they were, they caught a fish and they ate every part of the fish. And the person was really surprised by how sweet the eyeballs were. And it was just this, this whole notion that we know I, when you're hungry, it changes how good food is, especially if you're really, really hungry. I mean, the food starts getting, it starts tasting better and better. Um, when you're, when you're dehydrated or, or when you need salt or something, you know, the foods that you need are going to taste really, really good. And the foods you don't need are, are not going to taste as good. And so this is, we know that the survive at the survival level, it rewires the brain and it rewires the chemical paradigms in there. So if you're engaging in a survival mechanism and fear is at play, the reality is, is this is very likely to be an instantaneous scenario where we just need to take care of it. And we do take care of it. How do we know? Because we survive. But the challenge that we run into is when we think we're in this mode of we must survive when the, the reality isn't. Because the brain interprets that and will set the same mechanisms in motion. And this is where fear becomes really challenging. So for me, fear, when I'm getting involved, has a couple of, has a couple of levels to it. There's the instantaneous fear, I mean, bordering on terror or, or what, where there is an instantaneous threat. It's immediate in your vicinity and you need to respond to it. Now, there are ways you can train and condition yourselves to respond to these things in different ways. If you're a martial artist, then you can't, then you have options when it comes to a physical confrontation because you have been trained in this. And so the, the fear may or may not there. I was a mil, I was in the military. I, I, I served four years as an infantryman. And during that time, the training that we had allowed us to take automatic action in the face of fear so that we didn't stagnate in the face of fear. We didn't freeze, which is one of the reactions that we do. But that isn't the fear that most people are, are engaged with. The fear that I see that most people are engaged with is at the next level. So you've got survival. When survival is taken care of, the next need is safety. And safety is the area where the most interesting inter interaction or relationship with fear seems to take place. When I, as a, as a, as a managing a manager of teams, uh, when I, when I was, was managing various teams and acting as a, as a coach for, for managers, one of the things that I used to do is I used to listen to the way people talked about the problems that they had. And you could tell by listening to them, which level was at play, which level of, of the hierarchy of needs was at play. Uh, when you have the we have to, have to, have to, we must, we must, we must, with a bit of desperation in the voice. That's, that's a survival mindset. That's, 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 that's a, that's that world. But it's risk, it's, it's risk aversion or risk management that comes in when we get into the real interesting conversation about fear. Because safety is a, it's a measure of do we have what we need in order to feel confident that we don't need to put energy or focus into risk mitigation? Risk mitigation is usually in practical application. It takes a lot of different forms, but risk mitigation is usually preservation against loss because there's a sensation of loss that usually leads to our, our recognizing of things that happen. There are two things that we remember. We remember loss and we remember pain. There is, it's actually fairly difficult for some people to remember, uh, we remember emotional pain. Uh, it's very difficult to remember the actual physical sensations of pain in a very visceral way where we can re-experience them. That's actually fairly difficult, but it is, 
very easy to mentally create the framework where we remember the sensation of feeling emotional, uh, feeling emotional pain <clears throat> and a desire to avoid it. A desire to not repeat that does exist. Now, this is where I, I notice that safety gets to be a thing. A safety is a question of have we mitigated enough risk to where it doesn't need to be a focus. And mitigating risk comes into being it, an, analyzing this risk. Now, in business, we do this in a very formal way. We, we take a look at the situation. We identify cause and effect. We identify what's going on. But in our personal lives, we short-circuit a lot of this, and we rely on our emotional sensation to determine what that risk mitigation is going to be or what what that's going to happen so we we don't actually intellectually apply so we're not bringing that notion of science into our world what we are doing is we're allowing the emotional side the passion side to inform us in short-circuited way which is a good thing by the way this is a brilliant notion of the human brain it's a wonderful way that allows us to take very quick action when needed but it's unfortunately sometimes we short circuit it and then it becomes debilitating so fear in and of itself fear of loss or fear of pain if you can identify what that is if you can identify if you recognize i am i am having fear is it fear of pain is it fear of loss and if you look at your pain, I guess one of the other questions is, is the pain I'm afraid of because of a loss? Because often that can be what there's that. The, then there is a, a way to address it. We can look at it. We can actually go and, and start analyzing it. Because if you're afraid of loss, it's because you care about something. It's because something's important to you. And it's good that there are things that are important to you. The easy example that came up in the conversation is actually when you go to meet somebody for the first time. When you go to meet somebody new, uh, it's terrifying for me anyway, and for a lot of people. It was it, when I was a kid. Geez, what a nightmare! And the part that was terrifying was there's the potential that they are going to like me, and that it's going to go well. There's also the potential that it's not. And the question that I had to, I, I, I ended up having to answer for myself time and time again, which I didn't realize at the time, but I understand now with, with, you, with, with a bit more experience, is, is the possibility of being rejected more painful than the opportunity is beneficial then the opportunity of being accepted or being embraced or being approved of or whatever it is i'm after is that is that approval or is that positive worth the risk notice it's a risk when the answer is no then fine when the answer is yes then we really should go take action on it is it going to be uncomfortable sure do we want that uncomfort? No. Do we want to do we want to experience this this whole world of uncertainty and put at risk the the wrong answer? That, no, it's not pleasant. But that's okay. Because preserving ourselves in pleasantness is not the point. The point is is it worth the risk to gain over the loss? And if we can frame our brain to understand fear as fear is telling us that something that we care about is at risk, and we can actively use that as a trigger to re-engage our scientific mind, to make the observation and identify what is it that we care about that's at risk here, and what are we going to gain if that risk isn't realized, and is it worth it? Then it becomes a choice. And that's always what I look for. When I'm looking for excellence, excellence in life isn't about, isn't so much about being better than other people or, or elevating my own, you know, superhuman, powerful strength, whatever that is. 
It isn't about that. It's about engaging actively in the world around me and manifesting my choice to bring about the best outcome I can to whatever situation I find myself in. And that's beneficial for myself, beneficial for others. It's not, it, it, it's, it's got multi-dimensional, multi-dimensions to it. And in every time, if I'm going to put myself or something about me or some aspect of myself at risk, fear is going to raise its head. Now, if I respond to the fear by just saying, I am afraid and therefore I'm going to put my head in the sand, that is an option. And sometimes that's the right option. I'm not going to say it isn't because sometimes Look, fear serves a very valuable purpose. We let it overshadow its purpose. We let it go beyond its purpose. We let it go further than it's supposed to. But the reality is it serves a very valuable purpose. And that very valuable purpose is informing us that something that we care about is at risk. Something we care about, whether that's our life, whether that's our family, whether that's our friends, whether that's our relationship, whether that's our reputation, our ego, our sense of self, our uh, something we've been building for a long time, whatever it is. When we have at the lightest form hesitancy and at the most severe form terror, when we have fear, it means it's something that we are something that we care about is is at risk and i think it's wonderful to care about things i think it's better to know what we're caring about and understand the risk that it's at play and then to make the active decision as to whether that's a risk we want to pursue or whether that's a risk we want to leave behind and then we can choose and choice is, is always the the important thing now when fear comes in and it's combined with When it's combined with futility, when it's combined with helplessness, this becomes a more delicate thing. And helplessness is, is a, a side effect that comes with fear. It's when, it, when, we're, when we're afraid we have a fight or flight mentality and there's both are perfectly legitimate op options. One, we want to engage and take over and change the situation in which in which we find ourselves so that we can overcome it. And the other is we wish to escape it. We wish to escape to some other, some other choice, some other place, somehow we want to get out and get away. Well, if you fight long enough and continue to fail or continue to, to lose the fight or you, you, you get, so little benefit that you feel like the needle is really isn't changing and all of your efforts are going for naught, then you're going to move. There's a possibility of you moving into a realm of helplessness. And when you move into helplessness, if you're a flight, if you're in a flight set, then you're going to go into avoidance and quite possibly get into a depression and get into the, the futility of life and how nothing, nothing matters and everything is just, it's just never going to work. And this is a really bad, this is a really horrible spiral to fall down to. It's not an anger spiral. It's a depression spiral. And in this case, it's very difficult to get back out of that. On the other side, if you're a fighter, if you keep struggling and you keep struggling, and keep struggling, but you're not able to achieve something, you get invested in your solutions. You get invested in what you're trying to do. This is, this leads to frustration. You know, you're being frustrated. Your, your efforts are being, are being counteracted. Your intentions are not being manifested and frustration comes in. Now, frustration can very often in me, at least, be a big cause of anger. So yes, you can move from fear leading to anger. But notice how many facets need to be required in order to have that. But anger, so that brings me into anger, which is a, a another wonderful emotion. Oh, it's, it's no fun. 
it's no fun for me. It's, I don't like being angry. It's no fun for others to experience people being angry. It's, it is an ultimate in, I am not happy with the status quo and we need to change. Something needs to change. And I want to make sure that that desire for change is expressed. And often it can short circuit to take, take the easiest, most direct and often most violent approach toward reconciliation of the challenge. But for me, anger comes up when there's that, it requires that frustration piece. It requires that something be desired and that that desire be thwarted. And when that desire is related to fear, when that desire is related to my safety, the urgency and the, the, the importance of it becomes really, really relevant. It really comes to bear. And if I can recognize when I'm angry, if I can recognize, okay, I'm angry because there's something else going on. Whatever I'm angry about is usually the, gr the thing that anger grabbed hold of in the moment. It's usually not the root cause of what I'm angry about. And I, I see this because I see anger as a result of fear all over the place. I see it everywhere. I see it in the political discourse. I see it in the the news, which quite frankly is now mostly just political discourse, which I'm I'm a bit I get frustrated with. I see it in the way that we interact with each other. I see it as the result of, for example, some of our social networking and the 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 algorithms that allow Google to optimize your search results to be that which agrees with you uh, to find that information to embolden what you already believe. And this isn't a problem. I mean, it, it's, it's one factor. But one of the side effects of it is when you're confronted with something that is in opposition to it, this can trigger that, that safety concern and that fear. When someone doesn't align with your thinking, we as a human being are a tribal mindset. It's part of our part of our DNA, part of our way of doing things. And part of the tribal mindset is we want to get along. And when we have a challenge, it becomes very when we get people that, that don't we don't get along with, it does become very emotionally engaging. And it requires a certain level of discipline or a certain level of insanity to remove the emotional connection that people have to their own thoughts, their own ideas, and to the idea of, of challenging them, to the idea of expanding them. And so it doesn't surprise me that fear comes in. When ideas are challenged, when opinions are challenged, when light, these opinions and ideas are, are the framework of the experience of our lives. And when they're challenged, if we're not armed with ways of engaging with that challenge in a peaceful and charitable way that allows us to further the conversation toward the positive end, if we're not armed with that, then it can lead to us not feeling safe in our environment. Is it, is it safe for me to have the thoughts that I have because here's someone else that doesn't agree with me. Here's someone that has a totally different opinion and who even worse, maybe some of their, maybe some of what they're saying strikes true. I have, I have actually found it really fascinating that the people that get most vehement when discussing things, there's a big reason why I don't talk politics so much anymore. The people that get most vehement are when you make a point that undermines their own frameworks and thus rattles their approach. It rattles their safety. And it calls into question when that happens. It calls into question, you know, if I'm wrong on this, this is a foundational aspect of the way that I think and the way that I live my life. If I'm wrong on this, what else am I wrong on? And that's terrifying. 
that suddenly makes it so that you don't understand how the world works anymore, which means it's not predictable, which means it's not safe. And this can definitely bring up, this can elevate that fear and elevate that concern. Now, if you avoid fear, or if you ignore fear, then it it undermines the benefit that it can provide. It undermines the capability for growth. It undermines the capability to learn how to put yourself in uncomfortable situations. Because we don't learn from comfortable situations. We learn from uncomfort. We learn from, from frustration. We learn from, from failure. We learn from conflict. Unfortunately, we don't always have the tools that we need to reconcile these things well and in a way that brings out the reformation that we need, that brings out the transformation that allows us to incorporate the truth of what we believed with the truth that we're being exposed to. I mean, just because someone has a different opinion doesn't mean that your opinion or the various fundamental building blocks that brought you to that way of thinking in your life, it doesn't mean that those building blocks are now null and void. It is not a rejection of the base fundamentals. It's an addition. And in the addition of these base fundamentals, can we, can, can we use our, our scientific mind to reconcile? Can we recognize through our... our Diligence. Can we apply that industry of self to the process of giving ourselves the tools we need to be able to engage this way? Then fear doesn't become a, a debilitating thing at all. It becomes a tool in the toolbox. I actually, for the last few years of my professional life, I actually... I used to evaluate the, the value of something to me based on how much I was afraid of it. I would actually go and say, all right, so this is, this is a work environment. Here's this thing that I want to do. It's a risky plan. It's a, it's, it's, it's a, it, it has some potential. I mean, it's definitely going to deliver great value if it works, but it has some potential to fail. And if it fails, it's going to cost us a few things. I mean, one of the big ones it was going to cost is my pride because I was going to be, ooh, I might actually, uh, I might actually be stuck having to eat crow and having to look embarrassed and all the rest of it. But other things are, you know, I, I was a manager, so people's careers were in my hands. And the company was investing a great deal of money into my, my thoughts and, and, and my engagements. If I look at the amount we were paying the staff and, and all the investment we did in technology and time and effort and energy and other things. So putting those at risk is, was a big deal. It was something I cared about. And so it made me look at things with more care. It made me evaluate, all right, so I'm afraid of this failing. I'm afraid of looking foolish. I'm afraid of having been wrong. I'm afraid of misleading my team or those people that I'm responsible for. I'm afraid for wasting somebody else's time and resources. I'm afraid for the, the risk that I could be putting other people to. You know, when, you're, when you're a leader, that happens. You put other people at risk as well as yourself. And you are responsible for that. So being afraid of all of these things actually told me how serious the potential risk was. And it made me, it forced me to go and evaluate with more care and with more focus all of the possible paths to the outcomes I don't want. And I put certain things in play. I also monitor other things. I keep an eye on things. I keep an eye out for the risks that I see. It doesn't stop me. Because the other side of it is I do the evaluation of this is all this stuff that's at risk. Yes, but what do we have to gain? 
And if we try and we fail, is that worse than not trying at all? Because if you try, you can succeed. It was my old dating advice. Um, if you if if you don't ask, you don't give anyone the opportunity to say yes. It's it's advice for dating. It's advice for getting a promotion. It's advice for getting a pay raise. It's advice for anything that you want to do that you're afraid of. If you don't engage, then the opportunity for the positive outcome is zero. If you do engage, there is possibility of risk. And that is, that's great. That's amazing. That's fine. And fear can be a great measure for figuring out exactly how much risk there is. Now, the fear to helplessness thing that I talked about earlier, now that's real. I'm not going to argue that. The fear to helplessness is actually the thing that, as a humanitarian, is the greatest gift we can do if we can end that. And that's what I'm trying to do here. Helplessness is often a learned thing. And the short circuit that the brain takes for optimizing itself to, to best needs, this is actually a short circuit. It is a, a way that the brain wires itself to optimize to the evaluation that's going on, to the measurement it finds itself in. The optimization that takes place is... Once we have recognized that success isn't guaranteed or even going to happen without significant effort, the, the brain does its own calculation and it determines, all right, we need to stop beating our head against the wall. And it will begin thwarting you even in spite of, act, of evidence. There was a wonderful study. I wish I could, I could remember what it was. I went trying to look it up. I couldn't find it. It was a study about monkeys. And the way that they had the, the behavior set up was that they had a pole, and the pole was up, up, and at the top of the pole was a bunch of bananas. A monkey would climb up the pole, try to grab a banana. About two-thirds of the way up, they'd get hit with a fire hose, and a spray of water would come and knock them off the pole. Well, the first one saw that, did that, and everybody watched and saw it. Then another monkey went up and tried it. Same thing happened. Another monkey went up. Same thing happened. And after that, the other monkeys started stopping each other from doing it. Well, all the monkeys that saw this had witnessed the experience and had witnessed and had the physical evidence of it. And over time, what they did was they replaced the old monkeys with new monkeys. And eventually, you had... A pen, you had a, a pen full of monkeys that none of them anymore had seen the actual event. None of them had seen the water jet happen. In fact, the water jet wasn't even turned on. It was done. But the bunch of bananas are there, but the monkeys still had learned the behavior of stopping each other from going up that pole. And so here you have a whole pin full of monkeys, none of which have actually seen the event of somebody getting hit with a water blast when they go up that pole to go get those bananas. But they had all learned to preserve each other and to prevent each other from doing it. And this, you know, your brain operates kind of like that bunch of monkeys. Eventually it gets to the point where the evidence no longer merits the result. And what ends up happening is the brain short circuits and says, yeah, no, no, we're just not going to do this anymore. It's not possible. Well, why isn't it possible? It's just not. We don't have the reason. We don't need the reason because we've learned that this path of thought is closed to us and we will look to other paths. And this is where institutionalized fear comes in. This is where when we fear things that we don't know why we're afraid of them. This is really a, an interesting challenge. And this requires introspection to undo. It requires really, really interesting inner work to figure out and a willingness to go say, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna allow myself to have assumptions, or at least do the best I can to undo them. I'm gonna go and explore. I'm gonna go and see 
what is it I'm actually afraid of? Now, that's an almost impossible question to answer straight off the bat, so I give you a framework. Chances are you're afraid of losing something. What is it that can produce loss here? What can you lose? What can you experience that would be taken away from you? Now, if you can't find anything, then what's going to hurt? How are you going to get hurt? And is that hurt, again, related to loss? Or is it just pain? And these are things that, that by asking these questions, you can begin to tease apart the actual connections of why fear actually exists, what that fear manifests. And as you become aware of it, you'll see what's going on. And there's another way of doing this that I, I use. And I, it's an old technique that I've used for, for years, and it, it, it has to do with, with a way that I look at emotions. And this is, this is the better example here is anger. So what I do is I, I as, a, as a people manager, I, I have techniques and, and training, and I've been through hundreds of hours of training on how to engage with people and how to, how to make, you know, how to, how to reconcile conflicts and how to, how to resolve, resolve issues with the group. These are, I have a lot of techniques that, <laughs> that I've learned, and I found out that if I look at my emotions, if I look at my emotional being as a room full of people, and I look at myself as the manager of that team, that team of emotions, then I can begin to use the same conflict resolution techniques on them internally as I do as a person. I'm not going to get into the details of the, of the techniques, but number one is listen. And this is where anger, I find, at least for me, it was where anger gets really interesting. So I'm going to take that fear, frustration, anger paradigm that I talked about earlier. I'm afraid of something. I try to do something about it. I can't. It's not succeeding. Okay? I begin to challenge it. And my challenges go unanswered. My challenges are unsuccessful. They do not manifest the change. And I'm heavily invested in this change. I think this change is, is really critical for what we're doing. And so I begin to get frustrated. The outcome I want is not the outcome that I'm getting. And this frustration grows and grows and grows. And eventually, I'm not... I'm, I'm doing that definition of insanity. I'm doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting a different result. But that's because I'm not thinking about the result I'm after. I'm thinking about the expression. And that expression is not being regarded. Obviously, it's not being recognized. It's not being respected. Because if it were, then we'd be, then something would change, right? And so since that's not happening now, it's becoming personal. And it begins to transform into something where it's more angry where I begin to I begin to feel animosity toward others or toward myself honestly it's usually toward myself and then reflected and projected out onto others when I look at this as people I kind of look at it this way so fear didn't get listened to because obviously if fear had been listened to I'd have different tools to work with so fear kind of got uh, kind of got overlooked and then frustration came in. Our frustration was, okay, so I've got my frustration, but I'm not listening to frustration either because if I were listening to frustration, I would go back and evaluate. Okay, so frustration says what I'm getting and what I want are two different things. And the strategies I'm using right now are not providing that. Is it even possible for me to get those things? Does that even exist? You know, there's a whole lot of questions that I could ask about why that's manifesting out the way it's not. But I'm not asking those questions. I'm just experiencing that frustration. And nothing is happening. So my experiencing that frustration is me investing. It's me putting more emotional investment into the outcome. But without change. And since frustration isn't being successful, it needs to go find another emotion. It needs to go find somebody who's got bigger guns to go and manifest or facilitate the change that it wants. Who's got the biggest guns in town? Anger does. 
Anger has the biggest guns in town. And so you begin to get angry and you begin to, to manifest aggression out of, out of a desire to change against the outcome that you are experiencing versus the one that you want. And this, this anger, I, I, when I find myself angry, sometimes I'll even just go, okay, anger, anger, why are we angry? What are we really angry about? And anger just, you know, looks at me and goes, ah, pff, I, I don't know. Frustration called me. I don't know what we're angry about. I don't know what he's got going on, but, but I'm just, they called me up and I'm just here to yell. So then I go back and I get engaged in the, the frustration and I can find out what's going on. Okay. Frustration. What's going on? Hey, I'm just here because fear called me up. Okay. Fear. What's going on? Oh, well, you know, we, we really can lose here. And this is what, what I'm really worried about losing. And nobody else seems to be worried about it. And it seems to be a really big thing. But the anger goes away at that point. Once I've gotten to the point where I'm actually listening to what's going on internally, the, the action-based emotions, the driven action handling, that's just not there. And it goes away. So, let's see what happens there. The so the the thing that I'm I'm really hoping is that that we can understand that these don't have to be we don't have to have an adversarial relationship with them. And you know, the the whole anger leads to hate, and hate leads to suffering. Thing, you, know, you want to get involved in hate. Hate requires an absolute rejection of reason. And it requires a willful removal of information intake. And I'm worried about that. Because I think that being intellectually curious requires being intellectually uncomfortable. And we've already talked about how uncomfortable is not pleasant and therefore is a source of fear. So... I would like us to find a way to not fear being intellectually challenged or emotionally challenged. It used to be that this is what education was supposed to teach us. It was supposed to teach us how to engage in the realm of ideas in a way where we could have the tools that we need to challenge and to to play, to interact, to mingle with these. Whether it's a tool of logic or whether it's a tool of, of compassion or whether it's a tool of generosity and kindness or whether it's just being curious or whether it's a tool of debate or rhetoric or just speaking well, whatever it is. We used to be curious. I think we still are. But we also used to be well armed with opportunities and experiences that allow us to have our ideas challenged. And challenging ideas is not something that comes up very often. That's not to say that ideas aren't challenged. Their ideas are challenged all the time. All you gotta do is go on to any social media outlet and you're gonna see, you know, challenging ideas. But they're not actually challenging. It's just going to be the way it is. Hello, individuals. Welcome to the podcast. Glad to have you with us. So the, the, the challenging, 
don't think we're prepared for that anymore. I, and I'd like us to find ways to get back to that. I'd like us to find ways to, to re-encourage and to re-engage and to get back involved. I'm not sure what those tools are anymore that we can use. Uh, it used to be that the advanced education, that was its focus. Um, I'm sure that there are, are colleges and universities where that's true, but there are a lot of people that don't, you know, I don't think you need to go to a college or university to do that. So to that end, you know, my hope here is to be able to help provide some of those, some of those tools and some of those capabilities. And we'll start here with the basic fear, anger, frustration, fatigue, the results of what happens from being challenged when we don't have the tools that we need to be able to meet that challenge in a positive way. Look, my opinions need to be challenged. Your opinions need to be challenged. My thoughts, my reasons, my rationalities, they all need to be challenged. It's a question of what I do when they are. And can I work my way through them to do that? So that was pretty much what I wanted to talk about today. Now on the on the podcast. So this is uh, this is a new new venture for me. So for the podcast, uh, my hope is to be able to talk about a few things. Number one is conversations like this about various elements that have made life more successful, that have made it so that we can bring out more excellence into the world. And the things that bring excellence, again, are that, that concept of, of bringing reason to bear, but not to, act, not to the exclusion of other things. To incorporate reason, to incorporate industry, hard work, industriousness, the, the ability to build the strength of that, and the ability to make it so that it touches us, the, the, the beauty part of life, the way it, it engages and brings, the way that elevates our experience of life, not just our understanding of it. And so I'm going to be doing that. Uh, also going to be doing another one, which is about uh, intellectual curiosity. There is a few things that I'd like to read, and I'd like to, I'd like to experience them publicly with you. I mean, talk about the way I think about it, talk about what's happening, just as an illustration of what cool stuff there is out there. Uh, this originally came up as an idea. I started reading the Federalist Papers for various reasons. I wanted to, to see what it said. I've never read them before. I'm not, not big into constitutional scholarship or anything. For those of you that, that don't know, the Federalist Papers is a set of newspaper articles. When the United States was creating its constitution, it was in a world where the government was actually failing. It originally, originally had the Articles of Confederation, which was a, a way of bringing the, the colonies together into the states together into a confederation of states. And that government was the original government right after the the. American Revolution. And that government failed. Uh, it, it, it actually wasn't able to meet the needs. And so later, a new body came together to say, hey, we've got to change the way we're doing our government. And that is the, the Constitutional Congress. Congress came out and did this. And they put together the Constitution, which is today the founding document for the United States. It's the, it's the, the, the document on which the United States government has as its principal pro, uh, prospect and is the example for a lot of other nations that have, have used that and have springboard their own governments off of it. But during the time it was being discussed, it was being discussed in public forum. And by public forum, I mean there were letters written to newspapers about the various points. And there's a set of those called the Federalist Papers. It was written by Alexander Hamilton and others that were arguments for uh, various positives in the, at the time it was being discussed. The very nature of do we need a union? Do we need a one government, a federal government over each state? This was one of the points, it's one of the first points that gets discussed and argued and, and it gets debated. 
And there's a set of anti-federalist papers that have the other view, that have the other opinion there. But in I started reading them, and I when I got to reading them, it, I, I realized that, A, they lived in a very different world than we do now. And the funny part is the world we live in now is a result of the intellectual debate and arguments that they had at that time, which I like to think were a reflection of a larger global approach at the time. But the the arguments are fascinating and they're interesting and they make for for interesting intellectual fodder interesting things to consider interesting things to think about interesting an interesting reflection of a time that isn't today by people who reasoned and by people who engaged in intellectual um challenge with the tools that I'm talking about, with the tools that you need, with the tools that, that I'm not sure we have anymore. And so I want to do, uh, I want to do that. I want to go and, and, and evaluate that. So that's, that's on the table. We'll see about that. I also have a secondary thing. I, I'm a, I was a software development manager for, for years. And in that, there's a practice called agile development. And that's a that's an interesting solution to a very dynamic world. It's a it's a it's a business solution. It's a business process solution that focuses on delivering value in small increments in order to be able to be reflexive to change. And I want to explore that as an idea outside of the context of technology, outside of the context of building that, because. I think that there's some real possibility if we can get more more abstraction in there. I think there's some real possibility of making that work. So that's a couple of things I've got going on. We'll see how it goes. I'm looking forward to talking to you later. But right now, I'm going to wrap this up. I'm going to go. Thanks for being with me on the, the first one. So we'll see what happens and take it from there. Have a good day. Thanks, guys.